So we are here today to celebrate the joy of analog. And I truly do believe that we should celebrate this because despite all of the thought and effort and money that has gone into developing the digital products and digital media uh, and digital businesses that seem to fill our lives these days, we are fundamentally analog creatures. And it is in this analog tradition that we can find the seeds of digital innovation. Now, I say this not in the abstract. I say this from the specific viewpoint of having spent the last 15 years at some of the world-leading user-centered design firms. That's 15 years of diving into how people understand the world around them, translating that insight into the products that improve their lives and that make companies profitable. Now, the path to this has been a slightly eclectic one. It enriches the work, but it can make conversation interesting. I tend to say things like, you know, when I was at nuclear power school, and people think, nuclear power school? You mean like split the atom? Robert Oppenheimer? Homer Simpson? <laughs> yeah. I can't even fall back on old standbys like, well, this isn't rocket science because I actually am a rocket scientist. First job out of college, Star Wars. <clears throat> the insights that I want to share with you today come from this rich history. <clears throat> over the last few years, or uh, over the last several years, as a, a pilot and a naval officer, I've had the opportunity to play with, or rather use for very serious and meaningful purposes, two of the vehicles most commonly associated with midlife crisis. <laughs> Boats and airplanes. What's interesting uh, about, about aviation and, uh, and, and sailing is that aviation draws heavily on nautical traditions and nautical technology and, and nautical conventions. Ships and airplanes are both steered by rudders. At night, ships and airplanes use the same system of colored lights to indicate where they are and what direction they're pointing. And the officers in command of both vessels carry out their duties from someplace called a deck. What's even more interesting is where these two fields converge or uh, diverge. And one specific area in which the they diverge is the concept of relative bearing. Now, as you remember from the last time that you were flying and or sailing, relative bearing is the direction that some other ship or airplane is from you expressed in relation to the front of your ship or airplane. It's important that we have a common system of communicating relative bearing because the, the most frequent use of the concept is to say to somebody else, hey, do you see that ship over there? Do you think it's going to run into us? <laughs> now, sailors have a system that they've used for hundreds of years. It's common between most ships and most navies in the world. And the US Navy very thoughtfully explains it to us in the Blue Jackets manual. Ahead of you, towards the bow, well, towards the bow, towards the bow, is a head, although sometimes we call it forward. Towards the stern is aft, although sometimes we call it a stern. Generally to the left is port, and directly to the left is the port beam. Generally to the right is starboard, and directly to the right is the starboard beam. If you want to be more precise, there are a series of points that are scattered about in a circle around you at precisely 11 and 1 quarter degree intervals. And there are about a half dozen modifiers that you can kind of mix in there and come up with these really sort of salty sounding directions like, oh, she's dead ahead. She's fine on the starboard bow. Two points, or rather four points, abaft the starboard beam, which could also be expressed as on the starboard quarter. Is this a little bit confusing? It takes practice. New sailors spend time studying this new language. They're coached by their shipmates. And over time, the proper usage of it, the mastery of it, becomes a point of pride. You, you might almost say that people have fallen in love with this language. And no navy in the world would consider changing from it. It's a behavior not unlike the behavior of a lot of tech companies, ones that have fallen in love with their own technology, ones that uh, 
design products that are difficult to use, and ones that encourage their customers to RTFM. Now, <clears throat> faced with this need to, to communicate relative bearing, aviators, on the other hand, turn to the clock for inspiration. In fact, they turn to the analog clock. Imagine yourself standing on the face of a clock. Ahead of you is 12 o'clock. To the right is 3 o'clock. And if you actually close your eyes and imagine yourself standing on the face of a clock, if you actually close your eyes and imagine yourself standing on the face of a clock, well, then the names of all of these other directions are immediately apparent. Now, military aviators didn't actually invent this system, but they definitely embraced it. And why is that? Well, in 1930, the first year that American pilots were required to be licensed, there were 15,280 of them. Over the next 10 years, this number did not change appreciably. Over the five years following that, the US Army and US Navy trained 314,000 new pilots. These new pilots had hundreds of concepts and hundreds of skills that they had to learn. They had to integrate them so thoroughly and so completely that they would be effortless, that they could count on them in the heat of battle to make the difference between life and death. These pilots were alone in the cockpit. They didn't have a whole bunch of shipmates to coach them along the way. And they weren't immersed in a culture that had fallen in love with some arcane system of terminology. So this analog of imagine yourself standing on the face of a clock was something that referred to an object that was, was very present in everyday life and easily translated into a very difficult, uh, very different physical situation. So these are kind of fun stories, but why do we actually care about it? Well, we care about it because it illustrates two fundamentally different approaches to the problem of new product development. Faced with the same need to understand and communicate uh, a fairly complex idea, relative bearing, the Navy decided to make its recruits new, uh, learn a new and somewhat arcane language, one that in fairness seemed simple to the senior decision makers. They were expert users. The Air Corps, on the other hand, looked for an analog that would explain the concept easily, simply. Now, I teach product development here at the Rady School. I take MBA students who are not designers. And after a quarter, I send them out to develop a new product in a field in which they have never worked before. And I'm not going to say what that new product has to be, because I, I see some of my students here, and I haven't unveiled that to them yet. What they come back with is amazing. I mean, the products are thoughtful, appropriate, and easy to use. How are they able to accomplish this in just a quarter? Well, it's because over the course of the quarter, I share with them some secrets, some tools and techniques and perspectives that are commonly used, well understood within the design community, but which have not been shared with the business community. Today, I am going to share with you one of those secrets. In fact, I'm going to share with you what is probably the most powerful of those secrets, the concept of design by analogy. In design by analogy, we go out and we try to understand users' needs, what they want from a product. We analyze the technology. What are its advantages? What are its limitations? How does it actually work? And how does it appear to work? We look into the user's environment. We see the objects that they surround themselves with, and we understand how they view the world. And then we look in that environment, and we select some object that is familiar to them that can provide an analog, that can provide an analogy that will guide the user in how they should interact with this new product. It's important that the analog that we choose actually be a physical object that's present in their lives, or at least an experience, a physical experience, that's present in their memory. And the reason for that has to do with how we perceive and understand the world around us. Since about the 1990s, researchers have 
explored how the brain actually works. In many of the experiments, they've used uh, functional MRIs to peer inside people's heads as they prompt them with cues in either spoken or written language. What they've discovered is that we process language as if we were actually experiencing the physical sensations or carrying out the physical activities. So if I were to talk to you about walking along a trail through the woods, the areas in your brain that control balance and motor function would begin to fire. And if I talk to you about the roughness of the bark on the trees lining the path, then the areas that control tactile sensations would light up. The idea that we experience the world around us, even the abstractions of the world around us, thought and language and concept, as a physical effect upon our own bodies is the underlying reason that it is so powerful to explain new products, new services, even new lines of business in terms of their physical effect upon the body, in terms of objects that are present, familiar, and comfortable design by analogy. Now, the interesting thing about design by analogy is that it can be used at a variety of levels. It can be used to, to describe the entire product. It can help a user understand how it fits into their lives, and it can help a designer understand how to design the information and the affordances of the product. How the product says to a person, look, here's what I can do for you, and here's how you get me to do those things. Wonderful example of that, the graphic user interface, first conceived and developed by Xerox PARC in 1973. It is the basis of our interactions with general purpose computers to this day. And why not? It's very easy, very simple to understand, a very robust analogy. If I want to read something, I click on a sheet of paper. If I want to clean up my desktop, I drop the sheets of paper into the file folders. If I want to throw something away, I throw it into the trash can. If I want to see if there's something in the trash can that I might, uh, might not have wanted to throw it away, I can see that it's in the trash can. It's a very robust analogy. But there is a dirty little secret. If you actually opened up your laptop, and if you actually cracked open the hard drive, and if you took one of those disk platters and put them on a microscope, you would not see thousands of tiny little file folders <laughs> and hundreds of thousands of little pieces of paper inside the file folders with all of your writing on it. Shocking. They lied to us. In reality, we don't care, right? We don't care that the computer doesn't actually work that way. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot easier for us to imagine this analogy of a desktop and folders and paper than it is for us to remember command prompt uh, syntax. And at the end of the day, what we really want to do is read or write or play a game. Now, it doesn't have to, design by analogy does not have to operate at such a high level. We can use it for a single focused element of functionality. And it doesn't have to work for digital products. We can use it on physical products. Some colleagues of mine were designing a user-replaceable rack-mounted server. And they had the problem of helping a receptionist make up all of these complex electronic connections simply and reliably. They came up with a single massive connector, something that a field technician would just kind of slam home to get it to work. But the receptionist couldn't generate that kind of force and would be afraid of da damaging delicate equipment. So what they came up with was the analogy of a dishwasher door lever, because everyone knows how that works. Open, closed, off, on. It can be used for the initial commercialization of a new technology. We use it to co-opt the permissions and the accommodations that some other product has developed with users. It's when Sony decided to, uh, to enter the home robotics market, Autonomous robots were slow, clumsy, and stupid. But if a kitten trips over its own feet, it's just being cute. <laughs> and if a puppy doesn't come when you call its name, you just need to spend a little bit more time with it and teach it its name. And so when the Sony Ibo 
actually functioned as it was supposed to, then it was a clever little puppy. And when it didn't, well, what do you expect? It's a puppy. <laughs> Probably the most powerful use uh, of design by analogy is to define entirely new businesses or find entirely new businesses. The way that we use it is to ask, to find some behavior in the physical world and ask ourselves, how would that translate to the digital world? Specifically, how would I affect the analogy of that physical process in the digital world? How would I stay true to the simplicity, the tangibility, the authenticity of that physical experience, and how could it be made even more enjoyable, even more impactful, using the advantages of digital technology? Now, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give you uh, a billion-dollar idea, but we can take a look at some other people's billion-dollar ideas and see how these are rooted in physical analogy. eBay is essentially a flea market. A flea market that has the scalability and the searchability of the internet. Facebook is essentially graffiti, right? <laughs> We're writing on people's walls. And we have the same kind of social interaction of the scribblings building upon each other over time as you see what other people have written. And it has the power of geographic reach and the visual richness of the digital media. Texting and chat are essentially passing notes in class. They're meant to be private, it's often furtive, and it's generally tolerated as long as it's not too disruptive. And now we're passing notes across town as well as across the room. So my challenge to you is if you want to go out and you want to develop things that are entirely new, if you want to come up with lines of business that nobody else has ever thought of, if you want to design the products that people actually love, then connect people to your innovations by drawing upon their deeply held physical traditions and celebrate the joy of analog. Thank you. <laughs>